Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be and whatever part of the world you are listening to us. Welcome. I'd like to also welcome, warmly welcome our guest um, and I'll be shortly introducing them. My name is Arit Udo. I am a senior project manager at the University of Birmingham. I am also a global lead for the FIPWG Goal 4, Advanced and Specialist Development. Alongside um, two colleagues, one from Indonesia and um, another colleague from Australia, we lead on uh, meeting the goals, the FIPWG Goals 4. In this session, we'll be we are pleased to be delivering this event. And um, as you all know, FIP's vision is to have a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective and quality and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, pharmaceutical sciences, and pharmaceutical education. We are pleased to be delivering this event, and uh, our title today is Vaccination from Specialist Practice to Everyday Practice. And it's part of our FIP WG Go 4 and um, in advanced and specialist development. So um, just some housekeeping. This webinar is being um, recorded live and is also being live streamed via Facebook. The recording will be freely available on our website. We've got it on the screen over there. You may also ask questions using the question box that are provided. Uh, you're welcome to also provide feedback at the end of the session and just let us know, you know what you thought about the session when we finish. Uh, we we'll also invite you to be an FIP member if you are not yet uh, registered with us. Uh, right now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dazak, to introduce herself and also say a few words. Dazak? Hi. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening for everyone who's uh, watching and also to the panelists. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Dazak Ketut Ernawati. At the moment, I'm an academic and researcher as Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Udayana, Indonesia. And together with Arit, today we will be... Uh, moderating on the session on transforming vaccination regionally and globally program. This program is the first FIP transformation outcome based online program of its kind underpinned by the FIP development goals or the FIP DGs. Final outcome of this program is a historic global FIP commitment to action on vaccination in pharmacy. It's a FIP transformation, transforming vaccination collection 2021. There will be uh, there will be three series which run from September to December. Series one even has focused on identifying the needs of pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists workforce to deliver on vaccination transformations. Series two, which is our current series, uh, this even will discuss the action required to deliver on the needs identified in series one, aligned to the FIP development goals. Series three will focus on FIP member organization across six regions and how they have addressed or will address this action to deliver on the commitment to transform globally and regionally. Over to you, Ari. Well, thank you. Thank you, the Zach. Our, our series uh, will be, this series, you know, would help us um, create some you know, information about, you know, put our information out there about what our colleagues are doing in other parts of the world. And our main focus really is transforming vaccination regionally and also globally. So you can actually uh, refer to our web pages. The, I think the address is there on the screen. We urge you to engage with us and help us answer those questions. Type your answers in the chat box. And in your opinion, help us know, we would like to know what are the single, what are the um, factors that we should prioritize in order to transform vaccination services in relation to pharmacy. And we want that, we want that information, you know, what you think about it globally and also regionally. We also would like to, you to tell us what would be the most important achievement that we could actually say, yes, in my country, if we achieve this in the next five years, that would be really helpful. And also let us know, you know, what you think the FIP commitment to action should be. What else should we add on there? Um, today we have, we will have um, uh, four speakers talking to us. 
about what they have done in their other in, in, in their parts of the world. So in today's episode, vaccination from specialist practice to everyday practice is an interview format and it will focus on the FIP development goal for advanced and specialist development from the perspective of vaccination by pharmacists. We will discuss the process required to take vaccination from pharmacists from a specialized field that few pharmacists deliver in some jurisdiction to a standard part of pharmacy care in all practice settings and in all locations. Among other things, our main our, our main outcome for today is to understand the impacts of the FIP development goal four, and in terms of you know the advancement and specialist development and transformation of vaccination globally and regionally. Our first speaker today is um, Hane Adressen, and she's the director of pharmaceutical affairs of the Norwegian Pharmacy Association. I'm pleased to introduce her. She has a background in different positions and she's, she's, she comes with very, very important um, uh, caps that she wears in different, different, different areas. But primarily, she, she works with the Norx Medicinal Depot, which is a Norwegian subsidiary of the Maxon Group. Uh, NMD is one and out of three wholesalers in Norway that operates two pharmacy chains. The pharmacies owned um, by MMG at the Vita Supertech, about 270 pharmacies, and Deep Apotec, 75 private, private, privately owned pharmacies. I'm sorry, Hexen, if I have completely modeled that name. But yeah, I know um, Bethany is here and she works. She's, she has like 17 years of experience under her belt. She's a director for quality and pharmacy services most of the time and also has experience in logistics, HR and hospital tender businesses. During this time from about 1997 to 2014 in the pharmacy market in Norway went through a deregulation process which gave many once in a lifetime experiences when the regulations changed and the pharmacy change were developed pharmacy chains in Norway were developed and she has been involved in all of that process and she comes here bringing a wealth of experience that we can learn from. In 2014 she decided to establish her own private pharmacy and left NMND. Mara Pharmacy is a local community pharmacy that's the name of our local pharmacy Mara and she works there as a chief pharmacist and started working and continued working there until May this year. During this time vaccination was introduced as a service in most Norwegian pharmacies and she has experience from the practice work for the last two flu season. In May, she joined the Pharmacy Association as the Director for Pharmaceutical Affairs and today vaccination and further development of the services is one of her responsibilities. This September, Norwegian pharmacies got the right to prescribe the flu vaccine and there are a lot of activities ongoing in the pharmacies these days. And um, to date, they have already administered about 23,000 doses in Norway for flu vaccine. And so today I'm going to introduce her and she would um, take us through for the next 15 minutes. She's going to give us a bit of um, brief outline on what they have done and also set, um, let us have um, some learning points from her experience in Norway. Hane, over to you. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will in my first slide give you a very short update on uh, some uh, facts regarding vaccination in Norway. In our country, uh, vaccines and uh, in the immunization program are distributed by the no National, uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. They organize yearly tenders and operate as a wholesaler for vaccines. Vaccines are distributed by the Institute to the municipalities and further to the doctors and local vaccination centers. The national immunization program includes vaccination for the children, seasonal influenza, and this week COVID-19 vaccines will also be included in the program. We have today no program for vaccination of adults other than seasonal influenza to people in the risk groups. All the vaccines are reimbursed to variable extent by the state. And as mentioned, it, it is the municipalities that's responsible to offer vaccine services to the public. All vaccinations should be registered in the national register called SysVac. In the slide, you see that we experience about 900 deaths per year due to seasonal influenza. 
And you also see that the vaccine coverage in our country has been quite low. Last year, we achieved only 39% in the risk groups. We also have a very high pressure on primary health care. And as we speak, actually the doctors, the general practitioners are uh, in a strike because they have too many, uh, too long working hours and too many tasks to fulfill. So there is a very high pressure on primary health care and uh, there should be no big surprise that we feel that the pharmacy can play a very important role in primary health care uh, when it comes to vaccination. This slide uh, is, uh, will summarize how we have developed a vaccination service in the pharmacies. It all started in the pharmacies in 2017 when one of the pharmacies, uh, pharmacies chains started cooperating with some doctors. The doctors prescribed the vaccines and uh, after uh, a special uh, training program, pharmacists and pharmacy technicians vaccinated in the pharmacies. The project was very positive and got a lot of positive feedback. All the pharmacies in Norway are members of the Pharmacists Association and we have a very good tradition for cooperation when it comes to developing national services. And in 2018, we agreed to establish a national vaccination service. We coordinated the project from the Pharmacy Association and we also worked with the politicians and the decision makers to get acceptance and support. After we introduced the national service, we, uh, we then um, experienced that we in 2019 were able to uh, vaccinate 39,000 people in the pharmacies. Uh, but all the vaccines still had to be prescribed by the doctors. That was a challenge for us. Another challenge was that the vaccines in the pharmacies are not reimbursed by the state. But the feedback from the people that went to the pharmacies to get their vaccination were very positive. And the politicians were also more interested in what was happening in the pharmacies. And we worked uh, continuously with the decision makers. And in August this year, we finally were authorized in the pharmacies to prescribe vaccines. That was a really breakthrough for us. And it was the first time the pharmacists were able to prescribe medicines in the pharmacies. Uh, we uh, have a standardized program for administering the vaccines. I will not go through it in detail, but it's available on our intranet for the pharmacies. And it's the same um, program that's uh, being followed in all the pharmacies, regardless on which chain they are a member of. After August, we were able to publish a standardized program also for prescribing the vaccines on the 8th of September. Unfortunately, at that time, we also experienced that it would be a shortage of influenza vaccines this year. The pharmacist chains, they already in February ordered a lot of vaccines, about 300,000 vaccines, and the Institute of Public Health also ordered 1.2 million vaccines. But we experienced that it will not be enough this year. So uh, it uh, led to the decision that pharmacies were only able to uh, vaccinate people in the risk groups. And we unfortunately then also experienced that we will, would not have enough vaccines in the pharmacies. Uh, but even if there has been a shortage of vaccines, we uh, we're able to vaccinate more than 62,000 people in the pharmacies by the end of last week. And there's a lot of activities going on these days. 
Uh, in my next slide, you will see that uh, more than 85% of the pharmacies in Norway are now able to vaccinate. They offer the service and more than 2,000 pharmacies are able to prescribe uh, the flu vaccine. We also have now 4,000 pharmacy employees that's able to administer the vaccines. In my last slide, I will go through some uh, uh, work we are now uh, doing. Uh, we have done some important achievements, but of course, it's a big problem for us that the vaccines in the pharmacies are not reimbursed. So people going to the pharmacies have to pay out of their own pocket. Uh, but if they go to the physicians or to the vaccination centers, they uh, will not have to pay the same price. So now we are working uh, to be a part of the national immunization program. And we would like also to include the COVID-19 vaccines into the program for the pharmacies. We will work to improve the digital reporting to the national register. And we will continue to educate more pharmacy staff to be able to vaccinate and also, of course, to prescribe and hopefully also to be able to prescribe the COVID-19 vaccine. We cooperate with the universities to get the service as a part of the education program. And we will also now start working to prepare for the next flu season because the vaccines for next year, they have already to be ordered in just in a few weeks time. So we will continue to promote the important role of pharmacies in primary health care here in our country. And I strongly believe that the vaccination service will develop and that we will be able to present even more interesting figures from Norway in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Hani. Uh, now uh, we would like to continue to our second speaker. Uh, it's uh, our second speaker is Andy Sutcliffe. Uh, she is the clinical lead for pharmacy and quality use of medicine for the New Zealand Ministry of Health. She has worked in community pharmacy, general practice, resident, residential care, and provided domiciliary medicine optimization services in high needs community. In the last year, Andy has been the New Zealand Ministry Pharmacy Lead on the COVID-19 response. New Zealand's measles outbreak response and catch-up campaign, a member of the New Zealand COVID-19 Technical Advisory Group, and the Ministry Lead on the COVID-19 Clinical Technical Advisory Group. Andy has also worked in New Zealand and the United Kingdom has studied at Otago and Oxford Universities and is an honorary associate professor at the Auckland School of Pharmacy, University of Auckland. Andy has had a governance role on many of the New Zealand's national uh, pharmacy organization, including being the deputy chair of the New Zealand's Pharmacy Councils for five years. She has also held a number of ministerial appointments and her current appointment being chair of New Zealand's Medicine Classification Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andy. Andy, the time is yours. Kia ora tato. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and the wonderful opportunity to contribute to our discussion on this extremely important topic. Um, I'm sorry, I like many like to uh, start your video, please. Um, apologies, it didn't. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, like many people on today's um, session, I've spent lots of hours over the last few weeks listening to our global pharmacy leaders talking about the different steps on this pharmacist vaccination journey. 
Um, today I thought I'd take the opportunity to share some reflections on the things that I have um, had to, that we have had to put the most resource and um, energies into at a central government role to positively influence those who are writing and implementing our policy. Um, could we go back one slide, please? Sorry. The, uh, thank you. The organisations that are, um, have, I've, whose logos I've put on the slide here today are the organisations who have had them probably the lead role in the things that I will be sharing in tonight's talk. But I want to acknowledge that there are a wide range of um, pharmacy sector uh, champions and leads who have and continue to play a really important role across our whole system in shifting pharmacist vaccination to business as usual practice. The areas I'd like to reflect on are the legislative and regulatory framework, scopes of practice and competence standards, um, contracting mechanisms and funding mechanisms, and um, patient uh, records. Firstly, with the, in the context of legislative and regulatory frameworks, I have been su surprised how often in this journey I have been told that something that we wish to achieve isn't supported or enabled by our law. Yet when I've gone, when we've gone and asked the hard questions and done the due diligence, more often than not, the barrier isn't in the legislation, but it's in some other system, part of the system instead, like a contract that needs to be changed or a practice guidance that needs altering. So one reflection I would share is that it's really important to understand what your local legislation and regulatory framework enables and supports. If, the, if it is a change in legislation that's required, the process is probably quite clearly prescribed. However, if the barrier isn't in the legislation, then having a really good understanding of what the barrier actually is and who, who owns that barrier, who holds the levers and who you need to engage with to get support for a case for change. In New Zealand and a lot of, like in a lot of countries, the main regulatory barrier was the requirement for a prescription to be able to provide a vaccine. Um, in New Zealand, we have um, a ministerial committee called the Reclassification Committee, and uh, that classifies medicines. And we've had a number of pharmacy sector champions who have taken up multiple cases to that committee to free up the classification of a number of our vaccines. Initially to pharmacists only, which has supported pharmacists to provide vaccines within pharmacy. But recently we've achieved some change in um, influenza and our measles vaccinations to support pharmacists to also be able to take vaccination services out into their communities to be able to improve equity of accessing and support high needs populations. In the next slide, I've um, provided an example of the New Zealand scope of practice for pharmacists. The way health regulation, health professional regulation in New Zealand works is that if a scope of practice um, clearly articulates a role, then there will be competent standards and accredited training that underpins that scope. Now that's a concept that's well understood across the health professions, but one of the learnings that I've had in my role at government is that that isn't necessarily well understood across the whole of the health sector. And in particular, um, it's not well, being well understood by our policymakers. So we've put a lot of energy and resource into ensuring that that is well understood and that that information is really easy to find. So um, we have um, worked to ensure that the training for all vaccinators, regardless of which health professional um, uh, is providing the services is consistent ac um, across the sector. And in the next slide, um, there's a, um, there's um, a link to our 
um, Immunisation Advisory Centre. And at their website, it's very easy to find our immunisation handbook, which clearly articulates all of these concepts. So easy to find. In addition to that, in our immunisation handbook, we've gone that one step further and made it really clear that pharmacists, when they're doing vaccination, don't need um, extra cold chain accreditation. That is a routine business as usual part of our pharmacy audits for pharmacy licenses under our Medicines Act. And has always been the case, but it hasn't been well understood. So we've again worked to ensure that that understanding is there in the minds of our policy, hearts and minds of our policy makers, but also again that the information is easy to find. And we have um, also in New Zealand, we have the Pharmaceutical Society who's starting to provide training for our intern pharmacists, again to the same standards. And one of our two universities in New Zealand is starting to train our students and again, to the same standards. And we're making certain that those at central government understand that these standards are all consistent. One of the other areas that we have had to put, that we've put a lot of resource and time into is ensuring that the, our policymakers understand that we have a nationally consistent pharmacy contract across the country. In New Zealand, if you have a national consistent contract for a, um, for a health provider, it's underpinned by a consistent pricing and funding mechanism. Recently, we were looking to um, support pharmacies to be able to contribute to our measles campaign. And I was um, in our emergency team as the pharmacy lead for that campaign. And it rapidly became apparent to me that those who were making the decisions about how to roll out a measles response weren't aware that we already had a mechanism in place at a national level to fund an influenza service through pharmacy. So although it took a reasonable amount of work, the process is well understood in our minds on how we could introduce a measles um, schedule into our national pharmacy agreement. The last area that I'd like to reflect on um, and share with the audience is the amount of, um, if we could just go back one slide, um, the amount of um, opposition that um, we have had to introducing pharmacist vaccination services at scale across the country. Most of the opposition has come from general practice and the reason for the opposition was that introducing a new vaccination would fragment our national immunisation data, fragment care, and fragment the patient records. This opposition and advocacy came through to our Director General, our Ministry, our Ministers of Health, and through to our National Drug Buying Agency. However, we had a very strong political drive to um, increase our vaccination numbers in a couple of particularly po vulnerable population groups. And so we were able to um, work with our policy decision makers and our data and digital and, and our immunisation team at central government to support a case to build a web-based portal which supported pharmacists to be able to not only look up a person's vaccination status, but also to contribute the information around the vaccination that they were giving themselves to the patient's record. So we were able to understand the barrier, work with the different teams across central government to produce a solution to the barriers that were being put up. So, all of these areas that we have worked um, at across the whole pharmacy vaccination journey, I think is, has set us up to, um, I hope, um, achieve quite a sea change across our health sector and the way that pharmacy vaccination services are viewed. The COVID-19 vaccination opportunity that is ahead of us is um, um, has huge potential for 
shifting the thinking um, of pharmacist vaccination services as a business as usual service. In New Zealand, our conversation around a COVID vaccine is um, unfolding with our all of government vaccine response team, COVID vaccine response team, with myself alongside as the pharmacy lead and our um, general practice medis medical lead, um, all being around the table with the intention of bringing all vaccinators into the conversation and coming to a co common agreed position as to who will provide what services across our health sector to vaccinate our whole population, which is quite a different conversation to the one that we were having 10 years ago when we started this journey. So the, in the last slide, um, this demonstrates to me what a sign of success will look like. When, news, when newspaper and media headlines that talk about pharmacist vaccination services as business as usual and an expected service will be easy to find. And when I, all of the signals that our health system sends will send a clear signal that your local health professional and local pharmacist who is vaccinating is trusted and safe. And then we'll, we will be in a truly in a position to drive equitable access to vaccination for all of our populations. Thank you. Sorry about that. Our next speaker is Greg Eberhardt, uh, but before I invite him to speak, we have a question here for Hannah from Norway. Um, and the question is, um, is from an anonymous person, they didn't put the name, but uh, they're asking, the now that pharmacists are allowed to prescribe vaccines in Norway, does that mean patients no longer need to get a prescription from a doctor? And uh, there are two parts to that question. The other question is, are pharmacy technicians also allowed to administer vaccines in Norway? Over to you, Hannah. You can give us a quick answer to that. Yes, I will answer the question. Um, yes, pharmacy technicians can go through the same uh, education program and be able to vaccinate as, uh, in the same way as the pharmacists in the pharmacies. And when it comes to prescribing uh, the vaccines, it means that uh, the public don't need to go to the doctor. They can just go to the pharmacy and to have a prescription and to have the vaccine in the pharmacy. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, so our next speaker is Greg Eberhardt. Greg is the registrar of the Alberta College of Pharmacists. He contributed to the establishment of the National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities in 1995. He has provided leadership nationally through the Canadian Pharmacist Association through and the Council of Pharmacy Registrars of Canada. In 2008 to 2009, he participated in the CPHA Blueprint Steering Committee that developed a blueprint for the future of pharmacy in Canada. Greg led the development of the provincial legislation proclaimed in 2007 as a legislation that enabled pharmacists in Alberta to prescribe and administer drugs by injection. He was a member of the Alberta Pharmacies Association Pharmacy Practice Models Initiative, an advisory committee, and um, in a demonstration project in 2009, he focused on the innovative reimbursement methods for pharmacists practicing in and new practice models. Greg was a member of the Minister's Advisory Committee on Health in 2010 and was mandated to lead the development of the new umbrella health legislation. And he's a member of the Provincial Health Information Executive Committee. He's a member of the Primary Healthcare Strategy Working Group and co-chair of the Cultural, coach of the cultural Change Expert Advisory Group. 
Also in 2010, Greg led the development and signing of a tri-provincial resolution between the regulatory colleges and Alberta, in Alberta, British Columbia, and Saskatchewan to work together in supporting the principles of Western Economic Partnership agreed to by the provincial premiers. In 2008, Greg was presented with the, the University of Alberta Alumni Honor Award in recognition of a significant contribution made over a number of years to his local communities and beyond. In 2011, he was amongst the 103 Albertans awarded the Alberta Pharmacy Centennial Award for Distinction for having advanced pharmacy in Alberta to the leadership position it holds today. And in 2014, Greg was honored with the Outstanding Pharmacy Alumnus Award in recognition of pharmacy alumni who has made outstanding contributions to their profession, to their communities, and to society at large, or to the University of Alberta Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Greg comes with a lot of experience, and we are glad to have him here with us. Greg, over to you. Thanks so much, Reet, and uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to colleagues around the world. Uh, it's certainly my privilege to share our experience in moving the practice of pharmacy forward, a journey which began uh, back in about 1999. But uh, before getting there, I'd just like to set the stage a little bit. Alberta is one of 10 provinces in Canada. We uh, comprise about 10% of the Canadian population. Uh, we have about 4.4 million uh, Albertans uh, that reside in, in Alberta, and they are served by about 5.7 thousand uh, pharmacists uh, through about 1,500 community pharmacies. Uh, we don't recognize uh, the administration of drugs by injection or immunizations as a specialty. Uh, rather, when we began the discussion, our goal was to build capacity and have as many pharmacists as possible uh, uh, serve the public health needs of their patients. Um, immunization programs in Alberta are administered by the Provincial Health Authority. Uh, they set policy for each annual immunization program, and uh, we're happy to be part of the leadership team that contributes to that. So let's just talk about our journey. Uh, we began this journey back in about 1995 uh, when it was observed that provincial immunization targets were not being met, uh, and that included seniors, infants, and chronically Ill, Ill individuals. And there was a real opportunity for pharmacy to contribute to public policy changes. Uh, our premier uh, established a provincial initiative to change the role of all health professionals, recognizing that there was going to be a shortage of health professionals as our population grew and as the population aged. And therefore, it was necessary to move away from a history of exclusive scopes of practice to one where there were more defined and overlapping scopes of practice. And it was during this period that uh, our association of the day was able to engage in discussions to change the scope of practice for pharmacists to include both prescribing and the administration of drugs by injection. And we're rather proud that even in 2020, to this day, we probably have one of the broadest scopes of practice in the world where the majority of our pharmacists are prescribing and upwards of 80% of our, our pharmacists are administering drugs by injection. In addressing this need or opportunity, uh, there was a real uh, opportunity to, to respond to demand, to respond to the public need. And I think that that's an important part of change. It's important to understand what is needed, why it is needed, and why is pharmacy positioned to respond to that. We developed a solution to respond to that. I think our first challenge was to define what was really meant by pharmacists prescribing. Uh, our secondary challenge was to deal with the act of administering drugs by injection including immunizations. Um, we advocated uh, the need and we advocated why pharmacists were a preferred solution, largely based on the foundation of our learning around drug therapy and the accessibility and availability of pharmacists within our communities. I think that our ultimate success was through our effort to build alliances, both with regional health authorities and with other health professions specifically the profession of nursing, because until that time, the administration of drugs by injections and immunization programs were largely developed or delivered by public health nurses. 
and there was a lot of turf protection involved. So we needed to get nursing on site. At that point of time, registered nurses in Alberta uh, did not require an undergraduate degree to become a regulated health professional. And it was the desire of their college that an undergraduate degree be a fundamental educational requirement for that profession. That allowed us to enter into an arrangement with nursing whereby we would support their efforts to gain the educational needs that they desired if they would support our efforts to allow pharmacists to prescribe. And that was just an example of the synergy that was important to moving our agenda and our interest in pharmacists taking on this role uh, forward. We pursued legislative amendment and new authorities for pharmacists were approved in 2007. As I look back and consider some of the lessons that we learned during that period of time, it was really important to understand why pharmacists were a solution to this particular problem. And it was necessary for us to frame that appropriately and necessary for us to build a model around it so that it could be understood by policymakers and individuals who influence policy. Uh, that model needed to address what pharmacists could do and how they would address to the problem and why they might be the preferred choice. We also need to consider how and if, pardon me, we need to just consider whether there were any risks and how we would mitigate those risks if they were presented. I think ultimately we had to reimagine how. We needed to build alliances and get other opinion leaders to advocate for us rather than pharmacists advocating for themselves. I'd like to now talk a little bit about building uh, possibility, or pardon me, about building capacity. So once the legislation was approved, we began the journey of building competencies, training standards, and a process for authorizing pharmacists to administer drugs by injections, including the administration of vaccines. Uh, there was no funding available for pharmacists at this point of time. So that journey was very much about encouraging pharmacists to see this as an opportunity for the future and an opportunity for them to better meet, meet the needs of the public. One of our learnings from other countries was that the act of prescribing created a new opportunity for pharmacists to build a different type of relationship with patients. And now that pharmacists in Alberta were going to be prescribing, a change in the relationship was very, very necessary. We fundamentally had to change what pharmacy looked like and change the paradigm from a dispensing retail environment to an environment and a culture that focuses on pharmacists as primary caregivers. During the period of 2007 to 2010, we began to build capacity, but it was still a very, very small percentage of pharmacists that were involved. The first public payment that was available to pharmacists came in December of 2010 during the H1, H1, H1N1 uh, outbreak. And it was at this point in time that our provincial government found that they just could not meet the demand, could not meet the capacity that was needed to immunize the population of Alberta during that particular outbreak. And therefore they needed to reallocate resources to support pharmacists in this journey. Public funding continued to expand and we received our first funding for seasonal influenza in 2012. And that journey has continued. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, we received an announcement that pharmacists are going to be receiving public funding for other uh, vaccines um, uh, in the future. In 2012, uh, the role of pharmacists in, 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 in providing immunization and administering drugs by injection was starting to spread across Canada. And the National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities developed and approved competencies at that point of time. These competencies are now national scope and are the foundation for national programs uh, training pharmacists in this area. Many of our practice leaders who had a succinct interest in this role of uh, administering drugs by injection and immunizations chose to take on additional training and receive international accreditation. We now have pharmacists that are involved in travel clinics uh, where they spend the majority of their time engaged in clinical care with individuals who are traveling the globe and making sure that not only are their medications managed, but they are getting the appropriate immunizations to support them in those journeys.
So looking back in this period, again, what are some of the lessons we learned? The administration of drugs by injection and the provision of immunization fundamentally changes the pharmacist's relationships with patients. The concept of touch brings you much closer and further advances the element of trust that is important as our role as clinicians. We used Cotter's eight-step cycle for change and found that this was very realistic and true to the population of, Alberta, of pharmacists in Alberta. That while this was an academic model coming out of Harvard, uh, by, by virtue of our reflections and our practices, it was something that was important to moving change forward uh, in our province. I would submit that reimbursement can't be the driver of change, but it is an important catalyst. Today, uh, we have more and more pharmacists that are involved in providing immunizations, and that uptake has been driven largely by the availability of funding for these roles. I'd like to now share with you some of our experiences that we uh, have had um, over the course of the past 13 years since the scope of practice changed. In referring you to this particular slide, uh, I have included a link to the competencies for the administration of immunizations of any regulated health professional in Canada. Uh, the National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities now recognizes this document but has added one additional competence to it. And it is included within uh, uh, the link that I've provided to you. Today, training is provided in all pharmacy undergraduate curriculums within Canada. Although authorization to administer drugs by injection continues to be an authorization that occurs after graduation and upon licensing. 80% of the pharmacists in Alberta are authorized to administer drugs by injection and during the 2018-19 influenza season, pharmacists administered 55% of the publicly funded vaccines, then that's equivalent of over 724,000 doses. As we move into 2020, those numbers continue to incline. As we look at this from a public policy perspective, and we look to uh, the populations that we serve, the public now expects pharmacists to administer vaccines. That was something that they were quite opposed to prior to 2000. This wasn't even on the public's radar. So within a 20 year period, it has moved from something that is unthought of to something that is a norm and is now an expectation. It is one of the highest recognized services provided through community pharmacies. Pharmacies are seen as an accessible solution by government. And through these experiences, government now calls on our college and the Alberta Pharmacists Association to participate in policy development in advance of the uh, annual influenza campaigns, and we we're both involved in contributing to planning around COVID-19. I think it's important to emphasize that government platforms matter. Our opportunity to move our scope of practice forward was highly dependent on the motivation and the platform of the government of the day. If you cannot convince the government to support what pharmacists are about and what pharmacists do, this can be a really long journey. So it is important to understand what their platforms there are, to try and understand the need of the population, and to try and frame your solution in the context of that government platform. Success depends on consistent positive experiences that are free of risk. And I'm proud to say that as I look over the course of the past 13 years, our college is only aware of two incidences where uh, we've had adverse uh, events arising from uh, the inappropriate practice of pharmacists around uh, immunizations. So I think that it's a great success story. And uh, as we look to the movement of this being a specialty uh, practice done by a few uh, to a normalized practice uh, in countries around the world, I would subscribe that this is a huge opportunity for pharmacists to better meet the needs of their communities and to be recognized as both public health and primary health care professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, for your great presentation and success, uh, sharing success in Canada. Uh, before we moved on to our last uh, speaker, uh, Arin, is there any question in the chat box or the Q&A session? Yes, I think there's a question for um, Andy from New Zealand. Uh, and the question was, are pharmacists only allowed to administer MMR vaccine in New Zealand? 
Uh, so in, uh, in, in Alberta, pharmacists can prescribe uh, any vaccine. Uh, the only vaccines where there may be some um, additional training required is when we get into yellow fever vaccine and, and specialized things like that. But okay. MR, uh, influenza uh, are all within the scope of practice of pharmacists. Okay, thank you. Andy, is that, is that the same in um, New Zealand? Um, I've provided a, um, a written answer in the Q&A. We, okay. we have a short list of vaccines that are available through pharmacists without a prescription. Um, okay. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but some of them are HPV, influenza, okay. MMR, um, varicella. And um, we are embarking on a cross-system um, discussion around um, resetting um, that across all vaccines, except for, as Greg has indicated, there are a couple like, like yellow fever that may um, re retain some uh, stricter controls around them. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, I think um, we already had an answer during uh, Anne's Hannah's um, presentation. We actually said, Norway, they administer the flu vaccine. Am I right, Anne? Yes, uh, okay. it's, it's right. We can only prescribe the flu vaccines, but we administer also other vaccines. Okay. Most of the pharmacies. All right. Thank you very much. And so this is a question for all three of the speakers um, so far. So a question about COVID vaccine. And the question is, in your various jurisdictions, is is the COVID vaccine going to be provided free of charge or will there be out of pocket or insurance payment or what was the, what's the payment? Has there been any discussion around how that will be funded when it does become available? In Canada and specifically Alberta, we anticipate that it will be publicly funded. Uh, again, the goal will be to uh, immunize uh, as large a number of the population as possible. Okay. In Norway, the Minister of Health has uh, stated that it will be uh, for free, but uh, it has not been decided how it will be, um, uh, um, who will vaccinate and how, <laughs> so we don't know yet. <laughs> okay. Andy, any, any, any um, from In New Zealand, Zealand um, that decision is um, a long live discussion. We have yeah. a strong precedent here for all of our schedule um, vaccines being free of charge to the patient. So we have a very strong precedent for that being the case uh, for okay. COVID. And um, we have started our discussion in New Zealand as to who will provide the vaccinations and where we're bringing um, medicine, nursing, pharmacy all into the room and we will be making a, a joint decision across the sector as to, as Greg said, how we can get out to all of our population um, if we're lucky enough to have enough vaccine to yeah. vaccinate all of our population. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, so our fourth speaker today is um, Jorge Batista. Jorge Batista is the International Affairs Lead of the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society. And he's been in that role since 2008, and in that role, he's responsible for coordinating all the international activities, including representation at FIP, at BGU, at AFPLP, and the EURHCA, -E uh, permanent delegation in Brussels, and in other international uh, panels and discussions and forums. He is a member of the Council for the Lusophone Corporation and of the Qualification and Admission Council of the PPS, where he supports CPD and competency development. Yorge is the Executive Manager of the Biomedical Ethics and Regulatory Capacity Building Partnership for Portuguese Speaking African Countries Project. Uh, it's a project that is supported by the European Union and is financed by the EDCTP. After graduating in 2015 with a thesis topic on asthma in the pediatric population, therapeutic approaches in Europe, he worked until 2018 as a pharmacist in the South and Autonomous Region branch of the PPS in the area of continuous professional development, strategic planning, and the pro promotion of the continuous training program. He is currently a PhD candidate at the international, or in international health at the Portuguese uh, School of Institute of Tropical 
um, Institute of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he is going to be specializing in health policies and development. So in the next 15 minutes, he will be giving us a bit of talk on his experiences so far in the area of vaccination. You okay? Yeah. Thank you very much, Arit. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on the place that you are around the world. Uh, my name is George Batista, as Arit uh, uh, kindly introduced. Um, and I would like to talk to you today about the experience that we have in Portugal on competency development um, on vaccination. So uh, first, on the first slide, I would like to show you a bit of uh, what happened regarding the recognition of vaccination as a priority, some a bit of historic background and legal changes. So back in 2007, uh, community pharmacies were recognized as healthcare spaces, and new, law, new laws allowed for pharmacies to expand their scope of activities into new areas, for example, vaccination, as long as it is not included in the national vaccination plan. So a year later, in 2008-2009, there was the first nationwide pharmacy-based influenza vaccination uh, campaign, and this had outstanding uh, results. In 2010, the medicines regulator, Infarmed, recognized the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society, so the PPS, that is the, the um, uh, regulatory body that regulates the pharmacist profession in Portugal, um, recognized the PPS as a regulatory body responsible for vaccination training accreditation. So henceforth, we are the ones responsible for defining what would be the specific uh, details of vaccination training and how should we accredit it. Uh, three years later, in 2013, um, we created and developed the first pharmaceutical competency. Um, it's good to compare that, for example, Greg and Alberta mentioned it was in 2012, so the timings seem to be quite aligned. And fast forward to 2020, so as of today, we have certified uh, over 5,000 pharmaceutical competencies. Um, and to, to speak about uh, of this pharmaceutical competency, I would like to show you on the next slide the certification model that we have in Portugal. So to be able to vaccinate, first of all, pharmacists need to go through a theoretical and practical training. Uh, this is a training that is part theoretical, part practical. At least a fourth of it has to be practical. And even though the minimum requirement guidelines say it needs to be um, at least seven hours, most of the programs have 10, 12, 15 hours. Um, and this program covers a set of um, chapters uh, regarding uh, important uh, parts of vaccination. For example, immunology. So speaking a, a bit about vaccines, how vaccines work, how other injectable drugs works. Also regarding legislation, how is the law in Portugal? How is the framework? How is the landscape? What good pharmacy practices should be implemented? A big part, a big, uh, large chapter is regarding administration techniques. So the different vaccines that can be administered uh, in different ways. Um, is it intermuscular, is it intradermal? How is it the, the, the techniques? And for these, we use uh, dummy models that we inject with, uh, with, uh, uh, with vaccines. Um, regarding service safety, there's also a very important chapter regarding how um, a service can be, can be dealt in and can be prepared in the safest way. And of course, patient handling how to deal with uh, adverse reaction when you have an anaphylactic shock and so on. And because of this, um, this training has to be encompassed with a mandatory basic life support training um, that in Portugal is established that is at least four hours. So all of these um, chapters, all of these uh, materials are enclosed in the guidelines on vaccination service certification. Uh, there was a guidelines that the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society issued and, and they state the minimum requirements for accreditation of training. So other entities, uh, other institutions can provide training, but it's the pharmaceutical society who accredits the training and provides the certification. Regarding the specific competency, on the next slide, I'll show how the pharmaceutical competency has been certified since 2013. First of all, competencies are valid for a period of five years. So every five years, you need to go through a revalidation, a recertification training. And this recertification training has a set of skills and a set of competencies, a set of uh, knowledge that needs to be acquired, which is also described in the guidelines that I previously showed. And this kind of knowledge recycling is mandatory every five years in order to encompass with new data, new information, new vaccines that could be um, entered the market. To provide the service as a certified pharmacist, you need to go through the initial training. 
every five years to complete the recertification course and also to have evidence of continued activity. And this is the, the, the main focus on the competency model of the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society, that to be competent in a, a certain area, to have a valid competency, a, a pharmaceutical competency, you have not only to acquire the theoretical knowledge, but also the practical. So you, you need to have practice in order to ensure that you are competent to a certain service, in this case, um, in this case vaccination. So this is the, the, uh, the framework that we have been used since 2013 until today. And as of uh, uh, 2020, uh, we can see that at this moment, we have uh, more than a third of community pharmacies uh, have their valid competency, have their valid pharmaceutical competency in uh, vaccination and uh, injectable drugs administration. This is a service that is highly uh, regarded in Portuguese pharmacies. And it's, it's um, known that uh, on the first um, ever survey that was done in the first vaccination wide campaign, uh, 92%, over 92% of patients were satisfied or highly satisfied with the service provided in the pharmacy. And this shows outstanding results, not only to patients, but also to pharmacies who were able to expand their practice. And of course, for public health coverage, that we can see that these vaccination rates can skyrocket. And with these 12 years of experience with high satisfaction rates, the model and the, the vaccination service has developed until a point that we decided to test and to pilot new, new, uh, a new kind of service. So we, back in 2018, in the Lourdes municipality, which is a small um, a county in, in, in Lisbon, there was a pilot project uh, aimed at basic, basically providing parity of choice. So, uh, patients over uh, 65 years, uh, 65 or older, were able to choose if they would like to get vaccinated in the primary health care center units um, or in the pharmacy, and they would have the exact same conditions. So first of all, um, it was free of charge, so no administration fee. And second of all, no prescription was needed. And that pilot project that ran for two and a half months um, in the last month of 2018, um, so the flu vaccination rate um, up to 30%. So there was an increase in the vaccination rate up to 30%. And this showed incredible and outstanding results that really if you give parity to the uh, to pharmacy, so if they can administer vaccines in the same conditions as they have in primary healthcare center units, um, you actually can increase vaccination rate. So it's, it's good, it's a positive aspect to, in order to target, to meet the target of WHO uh, on vaccination of 65 years uh, or older of patients, um, that is 75%. I'm proud to say that last year we had, we hit the mark of 76%. So we're just 1% above the WHO mark, um, which is very good news. So for the seasonal flu that we are experiencing now in 2020, 2021, um, pharmacies can vaccinate in the same conditions as primary healthcare center units which is a very good, um, a very good measure and, and a very good policy in order to increase the, the vaccination uh, rates. Of course, all these lessons that we learned and uh, so far uh, made as regard to the future on what is that is coming uh, on ahead. So in future perspectives um, and, and reflecting on the lessons learned, we are confident to say that the pharmacies are now comfortable in expanding the vaccines that are administrated, administered by pharmacies in community pharmacies. So far, uh, there has been um, no, um, no uh, reactions, so no anaphylactic shocks, no adverse reactions are registered in pharmacies, which uh, resounds like a very good service. Um, we would like also to expand immunization in regards to off-site immunization under a pharmacy umbrella. For example, other countries are doing this, for example, Ireland, uh, that uh, in, in the seasonal flu is available to administer vaccines outside of the pharmacy, but under the responsibility of a pharmacy. So this is a very good model that um, uh, we are looking forward to see the results. Um, of course, expanding nationwide vaccination campaigns, specifically in um, uh, in cities or in populations that are a bit more deserted, so out of the, the urban centers, uh, rural communities and pharmacies can have um, an expanded role and actually provide vaccination um, coverage to this population. And of course, uh, something very important, the freedom of, of choice for citizens and inequality in care, so giving the same conditions for pharmacies and for public uh, primary health care centers. Uh, so 
patients can um, can vaccinate themselves in a pharmacy or in these centers uh, free of charge and uh, without need for a prescription. And of course, looking for the, the few months ahead that we have until we um, we arrive with a COVID-19 vaccination, pharmacies are available, of course, um, to put their services at the population service in order to provide COVID-19 vaccination for um, the population. So this was the, uh, the slides, a few slides that I, I, want, I would like to share with you. Um, and of course, it's important to relate all these that we have been talking for the past hour now um, with the FIB development goals. Uh, so of course, the, the um, FIB development goal number four that we just spoke, advanced and specialist development. And Portugal is one of those countries that can really pinpoint how the development of um, vaccination, of immunization um, developed from a, a specialized work a specialized service that is provided to some pharmacies to a nationwide service that is now available to all pharmacists. Of course, competency development is, uh, at least in the Portuguese pharmaceutical society, uh, vaccination and immunization is a competency part of the framework of the, of the pharmaceutical society. Um, of course, continuing professional development strategies. Since pharmacists are uh, part of these training programs and they need to enroll in every five years, re-register and recertify their competence, this goes into a strategy of continuing professional development. So making sure that pharmacists are always up to date with the latest uh, scientific evidence. And of course, the access to medicines and service, the field development goal number 18, uh, as pharmacists who are providing the service are actually putting forward their services making medicines accessible for the population and also expanding their pharmaceutical services. So these are just a few slides that I, that I wanted to share with you and I remain open for any questions that you have in the Q&A box and thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, Asak, uh, do you want to tell us what we're doing in the next, in our next series, the next um, episode of this? Well, thank you so much, George, for your uh, like interesting uh, and informative um, presentation. Uh, is there any Q, any question on the chat box or um, Ari? Before uh, I we... think I think we've answered all the questions that have come in since. Okay, that's yeah. great. Okay, for the last uh, session, so our next event will be uh, joining our next event on the third of October. Uh, that would be at. Uh, to uh, standard time, and we will have a speaker, Sofia Segura. She's a professor of at University of Costa Rica, and also from uh, Ireland, uh, Pamela Logan, as well as from uh, Hong Kong. They'll talk also on empowering pharmacies to deliver vaccination at health system level, which will be uh, guided by our moderator from FIP DG7 on advanced integrating services. And so I think if, is there any more question to be asked? Um, I think that is all for today. Yeah, uh, well, just a final one. So you have access to the website where you can actually continue to familiarize yourself if you haven't already with our development goals and how and see the things that we are doing towards trying to meet these goals. So thank you very much. It's been very wonderful to have you online here with us. And thank you also to our other viewers who will be viewing thereafter. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.